we're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. And joining us once again in this uh, tempest-tossed empire we call the United States of America is our good friend Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf is the host of Economic Update on Free Speech TV. He is an economist, an economic historian, and author, and much more. Without further ado, Richard Wolf, welcome back to the program. Thank you, RJ. I'm very glad to be here. So what's on your mind these days? Well, to be honest, and I say this with a touch of shamefacedness, um, I was watching a speech by our esteemed ex-leader, Donald Trump. Um, I believe he gave this speech in New Hampshire uh, a few days ago, uh, around, on or around armistice day that is the 11th of november um and he referred to that in this speech but the thing that struck me and i'll tell you why in a moment was words very close to the following that he trump pledges uh, to his audience there but to the wider audience watching like i was on television that uh, in his administration he apparently believes he has already won uh, both the past elections and the coming election, which is no mean uh, achievement uh, given human history, um, but that he will, on the first day, he will, quote now, root out the communists, the Marxists, the fascists, and all the other leftist thugs those are all words he used they're not my words um that threaten the united states he made clear that the greatest threat to the united states comes from within from the left not the right and not from foreign enemies and so his priority that was his point will be to root out these and then another word he used vermin v-e-r-m-i-n which i believe refers either to small animals that are messing up your house or your garden or in other words threatening something about your your daily life and the media covering it certainly the new york times the washington post and others were quick to comment that these words reminded the editors and the reporters of language used by Adolf Hitler in Germany in reference to Jews and communists there. And Mussolini in his idiom there, and uh, Francisco Franco in Spain with his idiom there. Uh, but all in all, here's what happened to my brain um capitalism found itself in trouble at various points in the history of that system now dating back more or less to the 17th century in england where modern capitalism got going before it spread globally and periodically when it got itself into trouble when the normal operations of capitalism generated either economic crashes or political splitting and division that broke a society apart. And I'm thinking here of the, the great examples, uh, a socialist government in Spain in the early 1930s that wanted to change Spain from the old leftover um, feudal Catholic environment that had existed there for centuries. And this, this broke the society apart, splitting between those who wanted to hold on to the way Spain had been and those who wanted to bring Sp Spain into the more modern part of Europe, France, Germany, uh, Britain, and so on. Another, And so you had a fascism develop which reimposed one of these two sides as the dominant side 
and then killed off, and I mean that literally, huge numbers of people who were the opposition. The second example, Italy. Italy, it happened, you know, after World War I, which shook Italy to its foundations. It was a society then going through the transition from an agrarian rural society to an urban industrial society, symbolized above all by the Fiat automobile works in the north of Italy, uh, in Torino. And the country was falling apart with a new dynamic socialist uh, labor movement on the one hand, and the old leftover from feudalism, particularly in the south of Europe, uh, south of Italy, trying to hold on. And Mussolini tried to straddle this splitting apart of Italy society. As a young man, he joined the Socialist Party. When he realized who was stronger on these two sides, he switched left socialism and established Italian fascism, cementing the decision to impose a particular regime of a kind of, think of it as a kind of deal between the industrialists and the old feudal, uh, also happens to be Roman Catholic uh, church, Italy, a Roman Catholic country. They had a deal of how they would take Italy through that transition. It was being contested by a working class that had other ideas. And so Mussolini destroyed that working class movement, killing off huge numbers of communists, socialists, labor leaders, which was usual. That's what Franco did in Spain. So that's what Mussolini did in Italy. He took the leader of the Italian Communist Party, uh, the very famous Antonio Gramsci, arrested him, kept him in horrible conditions in a jail for the next 15 years until he died, you know, literally killing him, uh, in this case, by imprisoning him until a couple of months before he died. And then, of course, the greatest example, Adolf Hitler, who also brokered a deal between what was left of the feudal part of Germany, Eastern Germany, with feudal estates and old Prussian uh, family histories on the one hand, versus an exploding working class on the other. In the last two elections of 1932, before Hitler was given power, the Socialist and Communist parties together got over half the vote of the German populations nation nationwide. And they were threatening to make Germany a socialist country, which, by the way, Karl Marx, many years earlier, had presumed where socialism would come first because it was the most industrialized economy by that time in Europe, having surpassed even Great Britain. And this was unacceptable to the employer class. It was unacceptable to the old feudals, represented by the head of Germany at that time, a man named von Hindenburg, an old Prussian military man, and the new industrial class. They got together, literally handed the power to Hitler to overcome this division, which Hitler did. He put everybody in Germany back to work, because remember, we're talking the early 1930s, Germany being decimated by the Great Depression that hit in 1929, and they turned to the fascists to do what fascists have always done, imposed on a population a kind of capitalism without the disturbance of socialist, communist, labor leaders, all of those that Trump dismisses as leftist thugs that threaten an arrangement that's great for capitalists, great for the landowners that are left, and horrible for the vast majority of people who are the employees of those capitalists. And I'm struck not only 
that Donald Trump, who clearly does not know history, who proudly reads no books, etc., etc., it's not him, but it is the people around him. And they have come, as he has, to language that is literally telling us what he represents, what his priorities are. And I have so far in the days that have passed not heard any major Republican candidates making crystal clear how they would never do or never say or never propose comparable things. So what can I say? I am now confronted as an American. I was born in Ohio. I've lived and worked here all my life. But I am confronted for the first time in my life with a clear repetition of a splitting of a country between a small, relatively small capitalist employer class and a vast population of people whose economic, political, and cultural conditions are producing every bad historical characteristic that this country's history has taught us, whether it be white supremacism or extreme inequality or a media that, you know, invents the reality rather than reports on it. We are in a very bad place, and there is no hiding from it. As I said to you, RJ, just before we went on the air, I am a product of refugees. My parents left Europe in the late 1930s. My father French, my mother German. Those are languages that I grew up with and speak to this day. And they were running for their lives in order to escape the horrors of what fascism did to Germany and to large parts of France. And the joke that my father used to make, he would sit back at the table and wistfully wonder, looking at me and my younger sister, would his children be faced ever with the fascism the way he was that drove him out of his country, drove him out of his language, drove him out of his job, drove him out of his circle of friends. Would his children perhaps have to go through it too, making the same journey across the Atlantic only in the opposite direction toward the end of their lives? Donald Trump, last week, this week, forced me to be with my father again, wondering whether or not this horrible prediction was coming true. Well, I have many thoughts about that, Richard Wolf, and, uh, you know, it's, a, of course, a powerful story and a, 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 and a powerful evocation of your parents. Uh, on, a note on a personal note on my part. So uh, my father was Jewish. His parents were refugees from the pogroms in Russia, what became Ukraine. My mother was not. My mother was Christian. Her mother was French and her father was, you know, English pioneer stock, whatever. But my mother, as I think I've mentioned to you, converted to Judaism to marry my father, not because he asked her to, but because at that moment in history, post-World War II, she wanted to identify with the oppressed. And the Jewish people were, were very oppressed, of course, at that point, as they had been over many years, many centuries. And uh, her one of the reasons she told us that she raised us in Judaism, even though I don't think she believed it theologically. Uh, we went to Hebrew school, we uh, we had bar mitzvahs and so on, uh, was because, and this, this was a bit strange on her part to be candid about it, but she said, if the fascists ever take over this country again, and this is in the 1940s and 50s when my brothers and I were born, if the fascists take over this country again, I want you to know which side you're on. Now, my brothers and I have talked about that a little bit, as in 
Well, wouldn't you trust that you've raised your children so that they'd know which side they were on, even if they weren't targets, first of all? Uh, secondly, you know, why make your children targets? But thirdly, and here, you know, as it seems to be my habit lately, I may lose some friends, but it would never occur to her that forms of fascism might arise that did not target Jews, but targeted other minorities. And perhaps generated a wave of hate that sweeps up Jews as well, hate and counter hate. But uh, it would not occur to her, for example, that there might be an international uprising, uh, upswelling of uh, fascist leaning politicians in Hungary, Trump in the United States, Duterte in the Philippines, among whom uh, they would find a sympathetic leader in Israel. In uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who has uh, reached out to several of those leaders, certainly close to Trump, certainly close to Viktor Orban and in Hungary. And so I was in Hungary when communism ended and when the rise of, among other things, anti-Semitism arose again, uh, you know, some similar forces to those of, related forces to those of Viktor Orban. So uh, I guess, uh, first of all, as you well know, Trump reflects not only a national, but an international phenomenon uh, or, or trend. We don't know how broad. And just a couple other points that I would add to it, if I may. One is you mentioned Armistice Day. Now, uh, you're showing your age a little bit there, because for some, since the 1950s, it has not been called Armistice Day. It's been called Veterans Day. And it struck me as you said that, that uh, it was renamed in 1954, Veterans Day. Armistice Day was, uh, was celebrated initially to celebrate the end of World War One, the war to end all wars, remember, and, which of course it did not, hardly, the end, war to end all wars. And instead of celebrating the Declaration of Peace, we chose to celebrate those who had fought in war. And there was lobbying behind that and all sorts of things. Uh, but that struck me. And it also struck me that, uh, you know, there are perhaps parallels to the von Hindenburgs of yesteryear today. And that while the corporate leaders of this country are, were very quick to take the knee in symbolic support to the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter, they didn't follow up with any concrete redistribution of wealth to the, you know, oppressed classes of this country. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, we've seen an uprising supported by both parties of certain forms of censorship. We have seen, uh, which is not to minimize the threat that Trump poses or the specificity of his fascist language, but, uh, you know, we've also seen the continuation of his policies in the Middle East. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, a continued, uh, emphasis on massive military spending under both Democrats and Republicans, uh, a sort of exaltation of uh, the security and national security state. And it seems to me, I guess, I'll, you know, my thoughts will close with this, um, that there was a poll done in the, I think, 2018, 2019, uh, using that massive database that's accessible to various people of of uh, adults in uh, developed countries, so-called developed countries. Um, and it polled uh, dissatisfaction with elites. And it found massive dissatisfaction among elites. So, you know, sometimes that manifests itself in AFD and, in, you know, alternative for Deutschland and in Germany or Trump supporters or, or, uh, or the new reigning party in, in Italy or what have you. But, uh, I was struck by what one of the political scientists said, which is that, the, uh, in, in an interview, he said, what we find is a rage against elites so profound and so indiscriminate that it seems that what people want to do is burn down the democratic cosmos. And it seems to me what we're looking at 
is in a sense that may have been i'm not a historian of the the third reich or the weimar republic but but it seems to me that what might have fueled or, or enabled the rise of mussolini of of fascism and it's interesting that trump labels the left as fascist this is sort of a you know bait and switch and labeling but but it, it seems to me that that this is all uh a toxic brew that it may not take more than 30 percent of the u.s pump population 28 percent whatever the latest figures are to think this way in order to create utter chaos am i being pessimistic here no i think you're being realistic you're hedging it about with qualifiers as i think you ought to we don't know I, neither you nor i pretend to be able to predict the future any better than anybody else can which is to say not at all um no i think we're we are now being forced to explore these possibilities that we would have hoped never to have looked at other than as historical events in the distant past and it would be irresponsible for people to keep fooling themselves that these words don't matter that this evolution of a more and more fascistic uh, approach to the problems i do want to say one thing and here i, I wear my hat as an economist fascisms around the world and not just the european variety spain italy and germany but the other forms of fascism the japanese and, and there were many for me they all have one thing very clearly in common they are attempts to impose by force of government the capitalist system mm. not to leave it to free market negotiate none of that it's when that system is falling apart when it has provoked so much distress unhappiness that the fascists arrive and the way they do it is very important they never deal with it directly francisco franco did not say i am establishing a militarized government enforced capitalism and hitler didn't say it and mussolini didn't say it and the, the japanese authorities didn't say it they were always busy coming up with other issues that they would be the champions of while they quietly and systematically took care of imposing capitalism so one of them wanted to overthrow the liberal uh, government that had been elected in spain frank franco was a general who overthrew an elected government but he didn't say he was going to develop spanish catholic uh, uh, capitalism no he was the champion of the roman catholic church he was the champion of traditional spanish family life and all of that and hitler did the same targeting the jews targeting the gypsies ta throwing them in the ba you know out with the bathwater of everything else you know that he could demonize but never to say i am imposing the capitalism that was in danger of being discarded by mass unhappiness mussolini did exactly the same thing targeting the critics of capitalism the trade unionists the socialists the communists who make demands on capitalism that capitalism can't meet give everybody a job give everybody a decent income come on provide what people need out of an economic system when capitalism is able to do it it doesn't need fascists there are periods when trade and international relations are such that the capitalist countries can get done what they need to get done to keep themselves going then they don't want fascists they want nice old republican and democrat you have the government for a few years then we'll have it then we'll turn it over to you the same old same old that we're used to in this country it's when all of that breaks down that you need fascism and if you want other signs beyond what mr trump uh says you can see it all around you the noise of the government we have a conflict with china 
A day ago in California, the leading CEOs of most major corporations were there to talk to Mr. Xi Jinping, pleading with him to allow them to continue to make the enormous profits off their dealings with China that they've been making. That was the real purpose of the meeting. The rest of it is noise. Noise to distract from what has to be done. Bernie Sanders, as the chairman of a Senate committee, had to prevent a fellow senator from having a fist fight with a witness from the labor movement because the conflict between a labor leader trying to deal with the real problems of the American working class is beyond the capability of a senator to cope with. We have physical violence more and more invading every part of our society, even though we are supposed to wonder why that might be, even as the United States is the number one maintainer of military bases around the world, intervenes around the world on a scale nobody else can do or has done. There is no war in Ukraine without the provision of above all by the United States, of the money and the weapons. The first reaction of Mr. Biden to the conflict between Hamas and Israel is to decide who he's going to give money and weapons to. What is this mentality? And then you're surprised if your people domestically, when they have a fight with their neighbor or their spouse or their children, become physical, impose violence, Treat people in the other political party, not by the gentlemen and ladies we used to see, but as the vermin and the thugs to be gotten rid of. Wow. And you can keep pretending that these are, you know, details, overdone expressions, which they are, but they are expressions of something. And that something is the breaking down of the American empire around the world and of American capitalism at home. The collapse of each of them reinforcing the other collapse in a downward spiral that most Americans know is going on in their souls. It's like that song of Leonard Cohen. Everybody knows, and is. I would only add, yes, they know, but they are desperately busy trying to distract one another from what is such a scary prospect all around them. And, you know, I would add to that, I guess, uh, some of the characteristics of these, uh, these successful fascist movements that pre preceded us, uh, preceded this moment in history, won a promise of efficiency, right? I mean, Mussolini was going to make the trains run on time. You had, you know, this whole, uh, what Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will film represented, the, you know, the clean, majestic buildings and the beautiful camera work and the, uh, you know, a, a, and the futurism of Italian fascism and, the, you know, we're going to make things work work for you. Things don't work. There's chaos. And we offer organization. And it seems to me, uh, you know, the marching in formation, all of that stuff, you know, the Japanese with the, uh, you know, with the symbolism around the emperor and so on, you know, there's a spectacle, all of it. And it seems to me that, that uh, the Democratic Party, which is the de facto opposition today to what Trump represents is absolutely paralyzed in the face of this phenomenon. It, it, it alternately tries to negotiate, to adopt some of the techniques, to make appeals to uh, a set of norms that has benefited really nobody but members of you know a few key members of the democratic party civility and so on that but civility for what so you know civility for civility's sake in a failing economic system and in a collapsing empire is is an impossible or extremely difficult sell to working people who are struggling so it seems to me that uh the momentum 
I mean, I know a lot of people uh, dislike uh, Donald Trump and, and are troubled by what he has to say, and I'm grateful for their dislike, but uh, I find the sense of self-assurance, it's very odd because, you know, here in Washington, I talk to and I have friends, a lot of friends who are, you know, work with the Democratic Party and so on. And they're like your economist friends when we talk about the economy, Richard. Well, they are oddly uh, content. They are not as disturbed as, you know, the alarm bells are ringing and they're, no, it's fine. Just as they said, no, it's fine in 2016. And when I was saying, you know, this Trump guy, he's got energy. He's like, you know, no, no, we've got this. And I'm getting this now. So, so I'm really concerned that, you know, if we have the dynamism of fascism, and let's be honest, it has a certain dynamism to it. Uh, it's repulsive. It's repellent. It might mean that you and I have to get on a steamship if they still run steamships and head back to where, where I, our parents came from. But, but, it does have an energy and it seems to me that on the other side there's paralysis and no energy and no responses to them maybe we censor social media companies that that carry facts and information or opinions we don't like which only fuels the flame do you get what i'm driving at yes and i think that mr trump and his advisors are playing on that. They constantly position Mr. Biden as old, over the hill, no longer altogether with it, senile, and all, all of the other. Symbolically, they do it. Literally, they do it. Uh, and, and Mr. Trump, who, you know, is almost the same age anyway, but is portrayed as much as they can as, as you put it, energetic and so, yes. But that's fascism. It cannot say what it's there to do. It has to have other things that people will find reasonable responses to things they're worried about. Americans are terribly afraid, really across the board, that they're not secure. Mm -hmm. they, their job isn't secure, their community isn't secure, their schooling for their children isn't secure, the future for those children isn't secure. And so they turn to the symbols, and they do it in the desperate way of, of mentally disturbed people. Look at the people who go out and buy one, two, ten, twenty guns, as if the guns in their closets or in their cabinets are going to make them more secure. If you ask them, why are you buying these guns? They'll say things like that to be secure. How many times have you been accosted in your home in a way where you need a gun? And they will tell you, of course, no, that hasn't happened to me, except for a tiny, but uh, how do you justify helping uh, Zelensky fight off the Russians? Well, you make it a matter of security. If we don't fight them over there, uh, well, then we'll have to fight them over here. You know, a mentality that would justify every foreign war by any society ever undertaken. And indeed, many of them have used this tired, old excuse. So you see kind of everywhere the, the hair trigger, these stories that are mounting of somebody mistaking their own home for a neighbor's home and turning the key in the lock of the neighbor's home and then blown away by a shotgun because the fantasy life of the neighbor was now going to be realized by a home invasion. And I won't even go into the folks that are having long conversations with aliens and all the rest. The insecurity is real, but there is no way in our culture of dealing with it. Why are we low wage, becoming a low wage country? Why is the only reason we have low unemployment is because we forced our working class to accept lower wages than they used to have? There's this, a vote going on now by auto workers on one of the most important strikes in labor history in this country uh, between the auto workers for General Motors and Stellantis. And a rising number 
of those workers are voting against a contract that had among the biggest raises ever offered. Why? Because if you look at the last 20 years, those auto workers have been decimated in what has happened to their job conditions, their real wages, faced the expenses that they have to cover. And while good, this contract, it doesn't repair what happened to them if you compare, say, today with 2007, which was the last year before the crises that we've been living through set in. And those people have a real reason to feel very insecure. New people getting jobs in auto are not paid what they used to get in terms of purchasing power. Not close. And that, that reality is raw material for fascism. Why? Because the capitalists have to worry. You cannot keep moving the good jobs to China or Brazil or India or Vietnam, all of which is going on. Replace them with low wage, no benefit, no security jobs here. If you're wondering what I mean, Ask any Amazon employee, any Starbucks employee, any of them, that we're converting our working class from the highest paid, best conditions, most secure to the least of all of that. And we're doing it relentlessly. And the pushback is coming already around us in labor militancy we have not seen in this country for a century. In that situation, the ruling capitalist class, let's call them by what they are, have got a real problem. If you don't deal with this, if you don't either meet the demands of the working class, which they don't want to do, or distract them, or repress them, make it too costly to do anything about other than accept the decline. That's what America is now confronting. And Mr. Trump offers the path of deflect them and repress them. The Democrats offer, you know, deflect them, tell them the economy is good, even though they know better, and hope their anger doesn't spill over and make them turn to Trump, which is exactly what Mr. Trump's only chance is not only to be president, but to avoid going to jail for the rest of his life. And that's a powerful incentive. It really is. And I guess my closing image is one of the low points of the Democratic TV uh, convention presentation of 2020 was John Kasich, conservative Republican from Ohio, highlighted like Liz Cheney and the other conservative Republicans were highlighted by the Democrats in recent years, literally standing at a crossroads where two trails went off in two directions, saying, we are America is at a crossroads. We're going to go down this path of totalitarianism, or we're going to go back to the country we used to be, which first of all, as a former speechwriter, is just a disgrace to the profession as symbolism and right but secondly and more importantly if the American you know Hillary Clinton ran on a third term of Obama and lost to Trump if if we're going to see a Democratic Party say well it's either fascism or the good economic news you've been experiencing for the, not only the last year but the last 40 years that I fear for the future and that's yep. my closing thought no I can't I can't do any better than that that, that that's the issue and Fascism is now on the agenda. We kind of knew it. We kind of didn't want to face it. And Mr. Trump, to his credit, is not going to let us miss what it is he's trying to do. He still has to win over sizable parts of this ruling class to his particular way of proposing a solution. Since that ruling class has no solution itself, it will be choosing between Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, which ought to frighten them for the reasons you've said, but doesn't seem to as they march zombie-like into the dead end they've created mostly for themselves. 
Absolutely. And on that less than cheerful note, I always like to end on a positive note, but some things don't yet at least have a positive resolution. Uh, Richard Wolf, as always, thanks for your thoughts. And as always, thank you for coming on the program. My pleasure, RJ. And thank you for the courage to put these kinds of issues up front and have an honest conversation about them. Uh, it is what makes your work as important as it has been and is. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.